Was it not stated that if the text, That Thou Art, uttered once, cannot bring about a realization of its meaning, then it will not be able to do so even when repeated? Vedantin. That difficulty does not arise, for nothing is illogical about facts directly perceived. It is a matter of experience that though the meaning may be vaguely apprehended from a sentence uttered only once, People understand it fully after removing progressively the false ideas standing in the way through a process of sustained consideration. Again, the text, That Thou Art, speaks of the identity of the entity denoted by Thou with the entity denoted by That. By the word That is denoted the Brahman under discussion that is existence, the witness, and the cause of the birth, etc., of the universe, as is well in evidence from such texts as Brahman is truth, knowledge, and infinite. Taitriya 211. Knowledge, bliss, Brahman. Brihararanyakopanishad 3928. This immutable is never seen, but is the witness. It is never known, but is the knower. Brihararanyaka 3, 8, 11. Without birth, decrepitude, death, neither gross nor minute, neither short nor long. Brihararanyaka 3, 8, 8. And so on. In these texts, changes like birth, etc., that befall all things, are denied by the words without birth, etc., and the properties of matter like grossness, etc., are denied by the words neither gross, etc. By the words knowledge, etc., it is stated that Brahman is by nature consciousness and effulgence. This object called Brahman, which is denoted by the word that, which is free from all mundane attributes, and which is by nature consciousness, is well known to the people who are adepts in the Upanishads. Equally well it has been known by them that the inmost self of the taught, that is, the disciple, is the meaning of the word thou, which is the seer and the hearer, and which is thought of as the inmost entity inhabiting the sheaths, starting from the gross body, and which is then ascertained as consciousness itself. That being the case, the sentence, That thou art, cannot produce a direct realization of its own meaning in those people to whom these two entities remain obstructed by ignorance, doubt, and confusion. For the meaning of a sentence is dependent on the meaning of the words, constituting it. Thus it is that for such people it becomes desirable to resort repeatedly to the scriptures and reasoning that lead to a clarification of the concepts. Although the self to be realized is partless, still many constituents are superimposed on it, such as the body, sense organs, mind, intellect, perception of objects, etc., that being so, one false constituent may be discarded at one attempt at comprehension, and another at another. In this sense, the dawn of a conception in a progressive manner becomes justifiable. But even this is only the penultimate stage of the realization of the self. Those of sharp intellect, on the other hand, who have no obstruction like ignorance, doubt, and confusion with regard to the object to be known, can realize the meaning of that thou art, even from the first utterance, so that a repetition in their case is certainly useless. For the knowledge of the self emerging once for all is able to remove ignorance, and no progressive development is admitted here. Namaste. So basically the opponent here is an inexperienced person. 
he doesn't have realization of Brahman. He's just theorizing and guessing, you know, and coming up with logical but wrong objections to the Vedanta. He's arguing against the Vedas. <laughs> this is really dumb, right? Because the Vedas, of all sources of knowledge, have proven over centuries to be the most reliable sources of information on the unseen, the unknown, but not the unknowable, that which has to be realized, and to point us in the direction of freedom, moksha, liberation. This is the theme of the Vedas, and even though they are assuming that the reader is not realized, yet they contain so much of tremendous value, even for the realized person. So the Vedas are the source. And then who are the interpreters? Those who have realized the instructions of the Vedas and experienced the result for themselves. So Shankaracharya is subtly pointing out that, hey, you know, you're just a noob. <laughs> you're not realized. You're not an adept of the Upanishads. You have not known for yourself these great truths. But you're simply speculating and you're trying to carve out a position, you know. Uh, one of the definitions of a muni is a philosopher who creates a unique position that only he really understands. Uh, and then, of course, uses it to argue against other philosophers. But why is this? Well, because in those days, in the Vedic days, one could make a good living simply by debate. Not today. And <laughs> nobody cares, you know, who's right or wrong in the post truth era or whatever nonsense this is. Everybody just throws their opinion at the other guy, right? Hoping something will stick. But it never does. Unless a person comes to the state of being where it becomes a necessity to uncover the hidden truths of life. Basically, they never do. We've seen this by experience, too. That one has to be set up. I think the word set up is a great expression because it's like, you know, if you have a bunch of, uh, I don't know, musical instruments, or let's say, in a studio, then before you can play, and enjoy them. You have to set everything up, all the equipment and microphones and connections and MIDI and this and that, you know? And if it's not set up properly, you can't enjoy the full freedom, the full benefits of all this equipment. So in the same way, you may know this and that from the Vedas, but unless you, as a person, are set up, you can't realize them. I learned this in my work with astrology, Jyotish, Vedic astrology, not Western astrology. Western astrology is useless. <laughs> but Vedic astrology can show you how your life is set up to push you in a certain direction, to motivate you, actually, through suffering to attain higher truths. And in the ultimate stage, one is set up in such a way that material advancement is blocked, but spiritual advancement is wide open. Go for it. Huh? And this is the case in, in my chart and in some other people's charts I've seen, where they have the moksha karakas. They have the possibility to attain in this lifetime, the complete freedom, moksha. So whether they do or not is still a choice.
it's still up to them. So no one is forced, uh -huh. but yet the conditions of one's life push one in a certain direction. So the people who are inclined towards debate and so forth are not really after self-realization. They're after something material. They want name and fame, position, influence, you know, and of course, income. So, of course, we're not like that. We're not motivated by those things. We don't really care about that. You know, that's why we are very casual. We, we don't, you know, put on any big fancy robes or whatever, you know. <laughs> because it's warm here. It's at 7 o'clock in the morning, and it's already like 86 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> so, you know, there's no need for clothes. There's no need for fancy titles. There's no need for begging for donations. Please go to my Patreon, you know. That's for amateurs. That's for the kind of people that are typified by the opponent in this discussion. But just see how Shankaracharya weaves together in this philosophical discussion, really a debate, all of these devotional threads of glorifying Brahma. This is very pleasing. This is very nice. Uh, one who has uh, regard and devotion for Brahman, reading this, will go, ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> he's got all the salient quotes. You know, he's got all the best lines <laughs> from the Upanishads. In these purports, these compact purports, only two or three pages long. But yet, he manages to embed all of these wonderful qualities of Brahman, infinite, light, effulgence, intelligence, consciousness, all these wonderful qualities. But you notice he also defines Brahman as it is defined in the sutras themselves, Remember, back in Sutra 2, from the first part of the first chapter, that Brahman is defined as that which is the cause of everything else. So Brahman is not a cause. Saguna Brahman is the cause. Nirguna Brahman doesn't do anything. But Saguna Brahman is the cause of everything. And this is Maya. So it is not that Maya is to be disrespected or rejected. And it is not like the neo advaitins that you can jump over Maya and reach Nirguna Brahman and realize it. This is not possible. Not possible. You can realize the Nirguna Brahman only by the grace of the Saguna Brahman. This is why realization of Brahman as the self, the witness, the all-pervading consciousness, the energy of both spiritual and material existence has to be known. Everything is included. It is not that we reject materiality and, and accept spirituality, you know, as a policy. I mean, some people try to do that, but it's phony. You notice they still are using a camera. They're still on YouTube. They're still begging for donations to support their big organization with all their overhead and all that. But we don't have any of those problems. We love Brahman in all phases whether saguna or nirguna, Brahman is everything. Therefore, Brahman is the ultimate object of worship and love, as well as the ultimate object of knowledge, because one who realizes Brahman gains complete freedom. Aum Tat Sat.
Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.